Who funds so-called terrorism? A report in the UK points to Saudi Arabia and Theresa May's government's under pressure to reveal its own findings. Many Saudis are also said to have links with ISIL. So why is Saudi Arabia accusing other countries of sponsoring extremism? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Now, the diplomatic crisis in the Gulf has seen Qatar living under a blockade for more than a month now. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt accuse Qatar of, amongst other things, supporting extremists, claims that Doha strongly denies. Now, a report from a UK think tank is pointing the finger at Saudi Arabia for being a key figure in financing such groups and raises questions about its role with armed groups like ISIL in Syria and Iraq. There's also another report on the subject from the British government, but its conclusions haven't been made public. Hashem Alba explains. Foreign funding of extremism is at the centre of a debate in the UK, and the government is under mounting pressure to make public its own findings. An inquiry was ordered in 2015 but Prime Minister Theresa May is still deciding whether or not to publish details. She's concerned the report might undermine Britain's strategic ties with Saudi Arabia. But another report from the think tank Henry Jackson Society has been released, suggesting Saudi Arabia is at the top of the list of countries sponsoring radical ideologies. Demands for the government to freeze arms deal to Riyadh are on the rise. No one should be distracted from the fact um, that Saudi Arabia has its own problems with the funding of extremism um, and so it is one of those cases of people in glass houses not throwing stones. Overseas funding for extremist groups is the focus of a simmering tension in the Gulf region. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt broke off diplomatic ties and imposed a land, sea and air blockade on Qatar. They accused Doha of sponsoring extremism, accusations dismissed by Qatari officials as baseless and politically motivated. The US is trying to mediate the crisis. Its main concern is that escalation might undermine its fight against ISIL. Two thirds of the senators voting. According this isn't the first time that Saudi Arabia has been accused of funding extremism. In 2016, U.S. Congress voted for a law allowing families of victims of the 9-11 attacks to sue Saudi Arabia. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers that attacked New York and Washington, D.C. in 2001 were Saudi nationals. The oil-rich kingdom rejected the bill, hinting it might pull out billions of dollars of investments in the U.S. Saudi Arabia and its ties to extremism across the Middle East was raised again in 2014 when ISIL took over huge areas of Syria and Iraq. Hundreds of Saudi nationals fight alongside ISIL and the Nusra Front. As international pressure builds up, Saudi officials insist they're taking all measures to clamp down on groups promoting and financing extremism. Hashim Ahbarra, Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guest for this edition of Inside Story. Joining me here in the studio in Doha, Shafiq Gabrais, Professor of Political Science at Kuwait University. In Lancaster, in northwest England, Simon Mabon. He's a lecturer in international relations at the University of Lancaster and author of the book The Origins of ISIS. And also with us in Doha is Marwan Kabalan, an associate analyst at the Doha Institute, the Arab Centre for Research and Policy Studies. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, Simon, can I just begin with you? We have a British government report that's under wraps. We have a think tank making some very interesting and, dare I say it, explosive allegations. How damaging is this, not just for Riyadh, but for the Middle East? Well, I think it's also very damaging for Britain. Britain's long been caught up in debates about um, the funding of Islamic extremism and, and the extent to which their allies are complicit in it. Now, I guess what we're seeing is that there are serious debates about the sort of the conflation of politics and religion 
and the extent to which you've got a, a range of different political crises being played out through this lens of, of sponsoring of particular groups. We know that across the Middle East, across uh, the, the 20th century and into the 21st century, a number of different states have sponsored different actors, different religious actors, different non-state groups, in pursuit of their own particular agendas. And what we're seeing in, in recent years is that this, the continuation of that type of policy. Mm. Now, of course, that involves sponsoring some groups that are perhaps beyond the pale and perhaps um, abhorrent to, to many people in the West, to, to many in the Middle East. But of course, that's one of the prices that, that some states are willing to pay in order to pursue their foreign policy goals. OK, let's bring in our, our other guests. Um, Shafiq Gabra uh, here with me in the studio. Uh, there's some pretty serious political mudslinging going on right now. What's happening in the UK in terms of the revelations of this alleged report? details of which we still have to see. One wonders what that relationship can be considering Theresa May had just visited Saudi Arabia a few months ago and how damaging it could be if countries start really putting pressure on Saudi and on European Union countries to say, God, do something about Saudi Arabia now. I think this is uh, the wrong focus. No one 15, 16 years after the September 11 attacks among the states can be exactly accused of supporting terrorism. To narrow it down, the kind of terrorism we see, such as ISIS and ISIL, is predominantly a result of very complex, close systems, socioeconomic conditions, different wars that have taken place in this region, lack of democracy, lack of debate, lack of, of actual education that educates for diversity. So as a result, what I see is that cutting the funding or whatever funding exists is not going to be the solution because already a lot has been done in that direction between September 11 and today. And if that's the case that uh, you can't cut the funding or the funding uh, shouldn't be cut, however uh, these governments um, spin that line, uh, one has to, in this particular case, we'll look at Qatar as well, but let's start with Saudi. You, they say they don't support terrorism. Uh, they say these are all lies. Is it a case that at government level they are fighting terrorism and that they've turned a blind eye or they're not interested or they haven't had the capability to deal with the grassroots support that these groups have and that the society at, at ground level are supporting groups like ISIL, also known as Daesh, and it's hard to control that? You see, policies of exclusion, policies that end up bringing about no hope in terms of equality, justice, decent life, people would want to have peace. Ways by which people can, can, can flourish and live, have a, have a decent treatment and a decent relationship with their government across the region is a problem. Mm. It's not a Saudi problem alone. No. It's an Arab problem. It's all over the place. However, you cannot accuse, actually, you cannot accuse Qatar. Therefore, I can, you cannot accuse Saudi Arabia, you cannot accuse anybody today of funding, but what you can do is that work on the socio-economic, political, cultural conditions of lack of hope that people call for justice. Look at 211, the 211 revolutions. That was the most peaceful year in Arab modern history because people had hope of a non-violent transition towards democracy. Look what happened after 2011 with the coup in Egypt, with the counter-revolution in the region, mm. with all the attack on democratic thinking, putting them in jail, cutting them all across, putting people all over the place into exile. That produced again ISIS and ISIL and violence and terrorism and hate and mm. anger from a very close situation. And very much so. We'll go to Marwan Kabbalan in a moment. But first, let's just bring our viewers up to speed with some of the issues that have been uh, coming to the forefront to help you understand how this programme is going to discuss the issues uh, of terrorism. I and mean, we have a clip from Saudi state television. A political analyst went on uh, praising the Saudi-led military campaign in Yemen, for example, while also going on to say that the kingdom has suicide bombers that can be mobilised within minutes. The military campaign against Yemen has proved that Saudi Arabia is a superpower. Such a superpower is capable of making big decisions and declaring war 
or observing peace without permission from the world's other superpowers or the United Nations. We are capable of mobilizing one million Saudi suicide bombers, jihadists or combatants very quickly. I myself can prepare one million Saudi jihadists willing to kill to go to paradise. Marwan, let me uh, bring you here also in Doha. I think what we have to try and make our international viewers uh, understand is what, uh, what a Wahhabi, a Salafist train of thought in Sunni Islam actually means and the conservatism around that idea and therefore why people find it attractive. Um, and it's that message that seems to be getting across um, and is a message that uh, Saudi politicians, Saudi civil society in some respects does actually perpetuate so before uh, answering your question, I have two points, important points actually to make here. Number one is that I would very much advise against playing the blame game concerning funding and supporting terrorism between Arab countries. This is very dangerous in my opinion. This is uh, very uh, counterproductive. The Saudis, they make baseless claims against Qatar, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians. They have over the past few weeks making baseless claims against Qatar and look now it's backfiring. We are hearing from every corner today that the Saudis, on the other, uh, rather the Saudis who are doing exactly this. But again, this. news on, uh, on today is the no. fact that we've got potentially the British government also looking into this and no. also potentially pointing figures if, if this, their report is also published. Me, yes, Suhail, this leads me actually to my second point, which is it's very important here to make a distinction between governments as legal and political entities and individuals and institutions. And in my opinion, it's not right to hold governments responsible. Or is it right to hold governments responsible for the actions of individuals or citizens who are actually carrying the nationality of these governments if they are not uh, part of official bodies like armies, like uh, uh, like governmental uh, institu institutions or organizations. I think this is a very serious and important debate that we must look at before actually getting further into this discussion. But, but let me go back But then to aren't governments responsible for the safety of their citizens and also responsible to a certain extent for the security uh, of the international community beyond their borders if their own nationals are perpetrating crimes such as suicide bombings or shootings it, it, however that violence may actually I, manifest I, I itself don't, I, so I don't know i don't know how uh, how can we actually proceed with this argument because you can find also the counter argument that no in fact governments are not responsible for the actions of certain individuals who are not representing these governments or these these countries otherwise uh, anybody who can carry a certain act of uh, a criminal act or uh, an act of terror anywhere in the world must be must his government be held responsible for his, uh, for his deeds and, and we're not actions. we're not I here Marwan I understand we're not here to, to, to you know bash Saudi Arabia over the head but we're trying to also understand the thinking behind why of these course, individuals fight actually, with groups like ISIL a course. large majority as the report said from Hashem and as we all know from a whole range of sources globally that a large proportion of those fighters do come from Saudi Arabia let me bring in uh, Simon just for a moment. Um, this, the psyche around uh, fighting for a cause, Simon, uh, and understanding for you know the Wahhabi Salafist yeah. um, train of thought is something that's been indoctrinated in Saudi culture sure. since the mid 17th century. This is not an overnight idea, and therefore it's very perhaps is it too ingrained in Saudi society for it to change in the modern 21st century. I think we have to explain to our viewers what this conservative train of thought really is and why it's so attractive. Sure. Well, I think it's, it's important to, to flag up a number of issues here. The first is that this, this Wahhabist train of thought is a fringe sect within Islam. It is a, a very small number of, of people that, that follow this, this line of thinking that had it not been for the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia would largely have been forgotten by the Muslim world, I would argue. But it's that discovery of oil and the, the deal between the Al Saud and the Wahhabist ulama that, that really helped to solidify the Wahhabist school of thought within modern Muslim politics. 
And I think that one of the reasons why it's, it's so appealing to many is that it does offer a, a real message of certainty. That Salafist line of thought is, as you say, conservative. It does want to have a very pure message of, of certainty and of faith and how one should behave as a true Muslim, going back to, uh, to the time of the Prophet. And I think that's quite appealing to some, that... Um, that amidst this sort of global crisis of modernity where people are struggling to, to meet their basic needs, they're struggling to survive and to provide for their families, and they're seeing such horrors around them, mm. that this message of certainty that, that Salafists and Wahhabists believe is, is appealing. But I should stress at this point that, that not all Wahhabists, not all Salafists follow, uh, follow a more radical, uh, violent train of thought like that espoused by Daesh. The, the Wahhabist and Salafist train of thought is just that fundamental return to, uh, to the Islam of the time of the Prophet. Okay. It may be seen as a bit of an anachronism, sure. but it is just that. Let me just uh, bring in Shafiq here. I mean, just to, to add to that, I mean, you, you say it's not a train of thought. You know, just what, in June uh, uh, of this year, there was in Saudi Arabia uh, a fifth killing of a family member, a fifth killing of, of a mother by her twin sons. They've been arrested because she didn't want them to go and join ISIL, there are those in Saudi Arabia that don't want this uh, to be expanded. They don't want their children to follow these uh, terror groups as such. Yet, there is the accusation, again made uh, by the international community sometimes, that Saudi Arabia is fighting a de facto fight against Shia regimes and by supporting groups like ISIL who don't like the minority Shia group, they are perpetuating that violence. See, it's, it's a phenomenon. It's an accusation, it's, isn't yeah, it? It's but, tit for tat. You know, what I want to say, it's a phenomenon. Many Jordanians are part of this. If you look at the numbers, many Saudis, Tunisians, many Iraqis, they're the ones involved mostly. So when, when you really look deeply into it, it's, it's a phenomenon that results from injustice as a result, some people in that context of injustice decide to go through what they see as an armed approach to their injustice, a violent approach to their injustice. Mm -hmm. And they look for an ideology. And they find, that since they live in a system in the region that education has not been in, in the best of, or, or, or democracy, or pluralism, so they borrow from as far as they go in religion, the most extreme they find in religion, the most extreme phrase, and they use it. So what I want to say, this phenomena is the closest to the Jacobians of the French Revolution. Mm. It is the closest to the Khmer Rouge of Cambodia. It's, it's a brand of Marxism, mm. Khmer Rouge. It's a brand of French nationalism. And it's a result of injustice and closed political systems. The only way to deal with it is to deal with these issues in this region. Okay. And we'll, we may have another 15 years of terrorism and violence. So okay. we need to open up the space, the political space, the cultural space, and, we'll, and the economic and space. We'll open that cultural and political space in a moment, but you can't ignore the facts. And so, for example, we've now got another video that we'd like to show you coming out of Iraq and the Iraqi authorities here. It's said to be from Mosul and in an area just taken back from ISIL. And in it, Iraqi forces are seen showing off what appears to be several items, including car number plates and supplies that came from Saudi Arabia. Take a listen. <laughs> Currently, we're in Al Rafai area. We stormed one of ISIL's hideouts and we seized all this hardware which belongs to them. When we searched the contents, we found out that they are all from Saudi Arabia. All of it. You can read for yourself. Saudi Arabia. All their gear, even the helmets, are from Saudi Arabia. They even have bazookas. Even the number plate. It's from Saudi Arabia. What has brought them here? Marwan Kabbalan in Doha, when you have evidence shown by a third party, in this case, the Iraqi um, authorities. It's hard to ignore. They are making their own conclusions. We can only uh, see what the video has to say. But it then comes back to where does the funding come from? And, and number plates don't just travel from one country. They are attached to cars and vehicles. You have to buy those sorts of things to be able to fight a war. And in this particular case, it seems they may have come from Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Suhail, I mean, we must agree that Wahhabism is a very strict version of Islam. And the Saudis have been promoting Wahhabism for the past six, seven decades, perhaps. 
but let's also not ignore the other element of this uh, phenomena, which is uh, Dr. Shafiq has been talking about uh, for, for the past 10 minutes, perhaps, which is exclusion, marginalization. When people actually are, get excluded, get marginalized and crushed by poverty, by ignorance, they find refuge in religion in general and in a, in, a, in, a, in a very particular version of religion. In this case, we are talking about Wahhabism. But look at a risk report that has been released recently about the top, the five top countries that ISIL actually is getting more of its recruits from. Number one is, in fact, Tunisia. Number two, with, with 6,000 actually uh, 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 Tunisian uh, joining ISIL in Syria and Iraq over the past seven years, and second is Saudi Arabia, third is Russia, fourth, Turkey, and fifth, Jordan. And of course, the list goes on mm. until we find many other European countries like Britain, France, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Here, actually, the, 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 the common, the, common the, 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 the optimal factor that actually brings all these people together is, in fact, marginalization, exclusion, poverty, ignorance, as I said before. So we have perhaps to look at why most people actually are coming from Tunisia, why most people who are recruited into ISIL are coming from Saudi Arabia. It's not only because of Wahhabism, because we find other Wahhabi people who are not okay. actually very much amenable actually to, to, join, to, to join Daesh. But they are but doing this Marwan in then, Saudi Arabia and in Tunisia because Very briefly, of other Marwan, reasons. because uh, uh, Simon is also agreeing with you, but I want to sort of add to that. Very briefly, Briefly, what is marginalization and poverty? What does it mean in Saudi Arabian terms? Uh, we know what poverty is perhaps in our own respective countries. We see it wherever we want to and where we can. But what does it mean, for, what does it mean in the Saudi Arabian context? Sohail, Sohail, the social class in Saudi Arabia is very big. There is a, a huge gap between the very rich, the royal family, which is tremendously rich, okay. and uh, the ordinary people who are actually very, some of them are very, very poor. In fact, poverty in Saudi Arabia, go and look at the indicators for, for development in Saudi Arabia. It actually reflects the, 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 real, the real situation in this country, which shows the huge social and economic gaps between these two. There are two different worlds in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so let me go over to Simon to then very quickly, to, to Lancaster, because Simon, um, some might say that those that follow or oh, certainly those that have uh, gone to Syria from the United Kingdom have come from disillusioned backgrounds, whatever their environments may be, but also have come back to the sure. UK. And there's a real concern, isn't there, about people who have fought for ISIL, have come back uh, to the UK, and the government has to think about national security in the light of the attacks, both in Manchester and London in recent months. One of the reasons why people join a group like Daesh is they feel a sense of of certainty that the group can give them that they're not finding elsewhere. They don't feel like they become a part of society. In the UK, there's a rising sense of Islamophobia. There's rising violence against Muslims. And if you're finding that, if you've got racism and Islamophobia on a daily basis, then that Daesh message of certainty, that Salafist message of certainty, and, okay. and combined with sort of the violence of strength and Sorry. force, then that, that's appealing. Get, try and get the final sort of comment sure. as such from Shafiq, because, you know, this whole train thought of uh, Wahhabism and, and Salafist thought isn't just a thought, it is actually taught in religious schools. It is part of the social structure, even preachers preaching it in Saudi Arabia as well. And, and that has a huge influence. It's very different to any other Muslim country in that way, in that it is very, very conservative uh, in terms of the way it implements and gets the message across. But that conservatism was there in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. It didn't create this kind of violence. So what I want to say... What's there, changed then? Very quickly, what, what's So changed? what's changed is that the Arab world in particular is going through a big transformation. The Iranian revolution came in 1979 and politicized Islam at a marvelous, at a huge level. So all this politicization of religion came into the political field. And when the political field is blocked, cannot express itself, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of writing, freedom of even dressing and travel and life. And, and so there's too much frustration. And then comes poverty and injustice, corruption and mm. lack of uh, accountable government. With all of this, what do you have? You have a, a nuclear explosion. This is the dilemma today of the Arab world. It will continue to be so as long as we don't deal with these major questions. It's not a Saudi problem only. Saudi Arabia is part of this problem, but it is a larger Arab dilemma. Indeed, and it's a dilemma that we will continue to revisit. We've only just 
touched, you might say, the peak of this particular mountain. Uh, for all of my guests, Shafiq Gabra with me here in the studio, Simon Mavon in Lancaster and Marwan Kabbalan also in Doha. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time on this edition of Inside Story. Thank and uh, thank you for watching as well. Of course, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Now, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sahil Rahman, my guests and the whole team. Thanks for your time and your company. Thank you.